older, I'm guessing we'll be able to get together in person again soon. That'd be great. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I just I think there's a lot of people that don't attend because they just don't like Zoom. I'm learning pretty much everything on mm -hmm. Zoom. We're having Girl Scouts, ballet lessons, and U.S. friends dinners on Saturday night. So it's it's been a technical a challenge, I'll say. <laughs> So, Dustin, you, you, you've gotten some more donations for the um, homeless from us. Look yeah, like um, there are a few items. Yeah, we got a few. Um, we got some Rick Baker, Jim Drummond, uh, you, and um, I think those were the, the main people who donated something from the club. But um, yeah, we've had a lot of good turnout with that. So, thank you all for that. And thank you for that, too. I don't know why this won't go away, there. but that's not my picture. This is a church. This is a group of women I meet with, and we meet at Shady Grove Presbyterian Church. So we call ourselves, it's not a, exactly a church group. We call ourselves the Shady Ladies, but somehow or another, it comes up when I'm signed in under my Google account, and, I, and I'm not signed into my Google account, and I can't get rid of it. So can you turn on video? Well, I have it on. That, see, this is what comes up till somebody signs into the meeting. Oh, no, I haven't turned it on. So sorry. There we go. Whoa, you had it a minute I won't ago. Do it. Okay. Wait. There you go. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> My secret is out. I'm a shady lady. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Is that at, at the corner of Yates? What what street is that? On, at yeah, Grove? it's at the corner of Yates and Shady Grove. Oh, yeah. here. Shady Grove Presbyterian. I actually grew up in that church. Yeah, we didn't turn up. So who's in charge today of the meeting? I think Dustin is. Um, oh. Yeah, Charlotte will be. Um, helping out, but I'll also help guide the meeting a little bit too. Okay, well, is can I have a minute to talk about uh, Gift to Life and our babies that are coming in? I'll be quick. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Yeah, we have a slide. I, I don't know if you know what it is, but a lot of the people do. Yeah, no problem. And, and the next question is, do y'all ever get that take them a meal invitation from Gift to Life? Yeah. Denise, I'm getting anybody it. else? Yes. Okay. Because I don't. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't even know when they're here anymore. It's I don't the same lady it. that sends things. Pardon me. The, um, oh, it's Stephanie. Is it Stephanie yeah. that sends yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, somehow you fell off her list, even though you're like an officer, huh? I don't know. I don't get it as a gift of life board member. That's weird. Now, Mike, you keep changing names. Yeah. Well, between Girl Scouts, ballet, and, <laughs> and Rotary, I have a whole list of things on my one computer. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm very out of touch with everybody. And we have oh. lots of new members. Dustin, you're one, aren't you? Relatively new? Relatively, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. This is BJ. How's everyone? Hey, Hi, BJ. Good to see you. Great to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. This is Susan. I know, Susan. How are you? I'm fine. I'm COVID weary, but other than that, good. Now, VJ, what's your what's your official title as uh, Ju July first gets along gets here for motoring? <laughs> uh, that's uh, 
as uh, far as I know, then um, unchanged ex except for a couple things. Uh, I said, just just be on standby. <laughs> It's a big secret. Is that what you're trying to tell us? <laughs> oh, not a, not a, not a big secret. Are you going to be one of those district governor in waiting people? Or are you that already? I'm a district gov uh, uh, assistant district governor now. Okay. So then the next step up is the. Uh, District district governor. It's not elect. It's the one before that, right? Uh, district governor nominee. Well, uh, right now uh, the lineup is uh, is in place. You got oh, okay. uh, Jenny Jones coming on, and after her, you got Nathan Lubin out of uh, Germantown. Yeah, he does a lot for Gift yes. Alive. Yes. Yeah, Germantown has got the baby right now. Or a little boy, no. Aaron. Actually, I'm not sure they do, because he they didn't uh, type your name in the chat, Carlin. Payne. Well, you may know more than I do since I don't ever get any updates. But at the last minute, he couldn't come because of a COVID test or something. Carlin Payne. Really? Well, I have all the telephones. That's all I can tell you. Or he's gone home real fast because. He was well oh, enough to do oh. it. I can't oh. keep it straight when yeah. Bill's telling me. I know. Uh, just, you know, <laughs> that goes. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Ingrid. Hey. Hey, hey Ingrid. Ingrid. Yeah. How is everybody? Hi. Hi. Ingrid. Hi. How are you? Hi. you? Well, Jenny's enjoyed us too. We haven't seen you in a while. Oh, I know. It's usually, um, you know, with the five kids, I miss it. Um, but, and I have to probably get um, silent pretty soon because it's so noisy in my background. But I'm looking forward to tonight's speaker. Well, um, thank you everyone for being here. I think we'll get started here. I think I saw Charlotte. Yeah, um, hello everyone. Hi Charlotte. But, another, um, exciting, another exciting night. Yeah, we're really excited to have Eric here. But um, I think we'll open up today again with the four-way test. So we'll start with um, one. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Is it fair, is it to, fair to all concerned? All concerned? Will it build good will 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 friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? All right, thank you all. And then just to give a couple quick updates. Um, so in March, uh, we're still continuing to collect some items for the Community Alliance for the Homeless Projects. Um, thank you all for your donations and help with that. Um, thank you, Charlotte, Will, and the board for putting together that lunch for the, the staff as well. Um, they really appreciated that and so did I. Um, I'm also a project coordinator at Community Alliance for the Homeless. And we also wanna thank uh, Jim Drummond, Rick Baker and Denise uh, for all uh, donating for the projects as well. Um, and if anyone else is interested in the project, uh, just let us know. Uh, you can email me at that email, uh, Dustin at caf.org, uh, C-A-F-T-H. And um, I can send you over that list. But um, in April, uh, for our next project that we're planning on, uh, we're planning on doing the Snowden School Laws of Life essays again. And um, the deadline to register is Friday, March 26th, this is Friday. Um, and this year, the topic is perseverance and students from sixth to eighth grade are all submitting, um, I, I think we have six uh, essays and um, we're determining and judging those. Um, and if you would like uh, the link for that as well, I'll uh, send that in the chat here shortly. And then um, just a reminder on some upcoming events too. 
Uh, our April focus is human rights. So we'll have Marty Tiptons Murphy, the director of Facing History and Ourselves, um, speaking on April 13th, and she'll be discussing more about how to create a more just and equitable future through her organization. And then on the 27th of April, uh, Herb Hiller will be um, speaking a little bit about the National Civil Rights Museum, and he's on the board of directors for that. And then I believe we did have an update here from Susan Scott um, about Gifts of Life, if she wanted to give a little update on that. I'll be quick because I know we have a, a speaker we're anxious to talk here. Talk. Um, I don't know who does and doesn't get the gift of life, take them a meal, but I don't anymore. And so if you don't get it, if you'll just send me an email or put something in the chat. And we have had children come and hand over fist, even with COVID. We are supposed to have one here right now that the Germantown Club is taking care of, but he couldn't come at the last minute. I think it was about a COVID test. I'm not sure, but he's just a baby and they really want to get him here fast. He's like barely three months old. So if any of us could take meals, we would really appreciate it. And they're bad on me to talk y'all into to taking care of one of these next babies that we have coming along. And it's really not as hard as it used to be because we can't even go into the uh, FedEx family house or the hospital other because of COVID. So you don't, I know that y'all, most of them don't speak English, although the last two have. And I know that's kind of hard for some people, but all you have to do is take the meal to the back door and call and tell the people at the front desk that it's there. They don't even let you come in to bring it to the front desk. So we would really appreciate it because we, we need meals for these families. And I'll make sure everybody gets on the list. And if we could some at some point talk about being the club in charge of a baby they're coming and going really fast right now much faster than they used to so um, that's it and if you don't know what gift of life is email me and i'll explain it to you because i know we have a lot of new members susan you might want to talk about the crawfish boil drive-through coming up. oh thank you i'll be quick but yeah every spring gift of life has a crawfish boil fundraiser that used to be an event in a in a venue, but now we can't do that because of COVID. So last year and this year, we've done it as a crawfish boil drive through. You come through in your car, pick up your order of crawfish. It's really good. There's a great man that does all the crawfish boils pretty much in the South here and, and in Mississippi. And he does a great job every year, but it's three pounds of crawfish, all the stuff that goes with it. My dog's real excited about this too. Um, if you can hear him barking in the background and you get a goodie bag with uh, coupons and things like that. And some of the bags will have gift certificate, money gift certificates in them. But we make money to support bringing these children here from third world countries. And it's gonna be April the 30th. I'll send out an email for this. It's going to be April the 30th and you do your picking up from five till seven and you can buy your tickets one or a hundred, however many you want online on our website. So I'll send you a URL for that. Excuse me. I'm drinking, drinking a Coke. I'll send you a URL for that too. Okay. I'm through. Thanks, Susan. Um, if you just want to put your email in the chat too, that'd be great. Sure. And then I think I will pass it over to I'll, Emily. Sorry, someone else. I'm something. sorry, I was. Okay. Um, I think I'll uh, pass it over to Emily now to introduce our speaker for today. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my honor to introduce Eric Barnes, who's our speaker for tonight. Uh, as most of you know, Eric's the CEO of the Daily Memphian which is an online uh, daily news publication here in Memphis that launched in September, 2018. He also for many years has hosted um, Behind the Headlines, a news interview show on WKNO that I think probably everybody's seen. And he also um, hosts a weekly radio show and podcast on arts and culture 
on WYXR, which is the new radio station out across town, Daily Memphian is a founding partner of. Um, you'd think that I would keep him really busy, but uh, Eric also has been the author of four novels and he's the publisher and part owner of a group of community newspapers in Tennessee. And then finally, um, he has had some interesting jobs earlier in his working life, including driving a forklift, working construction, and uh, freezing fish in a warehouse outside of Anchorage. So that sounds, all of those jobs sound very cold, actually. So I think I know maybe why he moved to Memphis. But anyway, Eric, <laughs> welcome and thank you for visiting Midtown Rotary. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, yes, the weather here is much better than Alaska or uh, the uh, Tacoma, Washington, where I grew up. But I want to start with this picture. Um, so the picture of me with the behind the headlines there, one, I think that's now nine years old. <laughs> and our original producer on behind the headlines, a wonderful man, Pierre Kimsey, who, who sadly passed away about four years after we started the show. He wanted to do all these photos, all these shots, you know, for promotional purposes. So we're in the studio and I'm, you know, he's like, well, cross your arm. And Pierre, I mean, I love Pierre. Pierre was so fant fabulous. It was awful when he died, but he came out of commercial TV. And so I was just kind of standing there awkwardly getting my picture taken. And he goes, no, look more serious. And I was like, all right. And then he's like, no, look more serious. And finally I was just like, oh, you just got an angry face. And he's like, perfect. <laughs> And so he, um, and, and so the, these photos, which do surface, are a, a source of great uh, embarrassment for me. So I'm, I'm really happy that you all uh, have used that today. And then at one point I had a mug made from the same photo shoot. And that is uh, Bill Drees, Amos Mackey, me, uh, wait, where are we here? Jackson Baker and Les Smith. And um, my family, these are keepsakes for my children and my family because I look so angry in all the photos and I'm really not an angry person. Um, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, how, how long, um, I don't know if I, this is a question for you, Dustin, or maybe Charlotte, who's nice enough to help set this up. How long do you want me to talk? And I really would love to hear, have more of a conversation, have questions. So I could talk for a little bit and then do questions. How long would you like me to go? Just go forward, whatever you... We are at your discretion. <laughs> well, I've had I've had six espressos today, so you may not want me to uh, to do that. But I'll, I'll talk for a bit and I'll pause every once in a while. And if you ask questions in the chat, I will um, please I will I will answer them and and we can do. I'll try to solicit questions, make sure I touch on the things you want to hear. Um, and again, thank you for having me here. Um, I think my general plan will be to talk a little bit about the Daily Memphian is now, give or take, about two and a half years old. And I'll talk, I won't repeat the whole history of that, but I'll talk a little bit about why we are and where we've been and where we're going. Um, a little bit about what covering COVID has been like for the last year. I mean, for good and bad and everything in between. Maybe my sort of take on some of the biggest stories coming up as we, you know, knock on wood, are sort of emerging from COVID. Um, and, and again, questions throughout that are great. And I will stop and, um, um, and solicit questions whenever, whenever it, it seems to make sense. Um, one thing, am I, can I share my screen? Will that work? Oh, no, I'm not able to. Um, is that possible, Dustin, or is it too much hassle? Yeah, let me see if I can figure that out. Real quick. We started, well, Dustin figures that out. I have just two, three slides I was going to show, and it really doesn't matter because I can just talk through them. Um, the... We started, we, form, we, we launched in September of 2018 um, after being formed in the summer, May, basically, of 2018, which followed a year of very intense behind the scenes uh, work, uh, fundraising, planning, um, and so on. And um, the Daily Memphian was launched um, because of this, what is actually a kind of national collapse in the business of local journalism. And so um, what... Um, what in the past 15 years, for instance, um, something like 2,000 local newspapers have gone out of business. Uh, something like 30,000 local journalists, newspaper journalists, have lost their jobs. Um, another 2,000 or so newspapers continue to operate, continue to publish daily or weekly, um, but have maybe one, two, or three journalists, what the industry increasingly calls a, a ghost paper. Um, and most of the papers um, in the country 
have been bought up, a, a huge portion of the papers, I have to say, and certainly in middle and large cities, have been bought up uh, by a, uh, a number, really basically four different um, newspaper chains, most of them private equity backed or, or hedge fund backed. And um, I'm a capitalist, I'm all for capitalism, but what that has meant is that the mission of local journalism has run into capitalism and it hasn't always been the best marriage. Um, local journalism since the you know, late 90s into the early 2000s has been a very, very difficult business. Um, it, a lot of local newspaper publishers like to blame the internet. In fact, I would argue that's not really true. There were a whole lot of factors that, that really hurt local papers. It started with um, the, the demise and the buying up of local department stores, which people here will remember as goldsmiths. And you know, there were local department stores that then got bought up into chains. And then basically were sort of usurped by uh, the Walmarts and Targets of the world, which did less advertising with uh, local papers. The internet came along and, and it wasn't the internet's fault that the newspapers played it really poorly and lost their a huge chunk of revenue to not to Google, but to, in many cases, uh, companies that are no longer even necessarily around. They lost their job listings. They lost their home sales. They lost auto sales. They lost um, help wanted. I think I mentioned all the classified business just evaporated as newspapers played things very poorly. And that was before Google and before so on, um, before Facebook and before the things that many, many newspapers now blame. Um, and, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, somebody maybe asked something. Okay. Um, and, and then newspapers made a, a very conscious choice, really probably 15, 20 years ago, to put their content online for free. And so everything from the New York Times to the um, commercial appeal, and I don't really want to pick on the commercial appeal all day today. There's some really great journalists there. This is not about us versus the commercial appeal. Um, we are in a, you know, it, it, I, sometimes I come across that way and I, I don't like it because I, I like all journalists who work hard and do good work. And there are many, many good journalists over at the commercial appeal. So this is not about that, but it is the, the, the commercial appeal is, is um, uh, owned by a big um, private equity firm, essentially <coughs> backed by a big private equity firm and has gone through the kind of dynamics that we've talked about. Gannett, it's a, you know, commercial appeals had what, five owners and six years, four owners in six years, something like that. Like many, many local newspapers. So like all those papers, the Commercial Appeal, others all made a decision to make their content free. And the story I um, often tell is that when I lived in New York over 25 years ago now, I was a college student or graduate student and I had a lot of student loan debt and then I was working and I didn't have a lot of money, but I bought the New York Times almost every day, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, three dollars on the weekend. I've done the math before. I probably spent about $250 to $300 a year. I never had a subscription to the New York Times. So I always just bought it the five years that I lived in, in New York. And I spent about, you know, give or take $300 a year. And I moved to Memphis and I got a subscription here and I could get home delivery. And then I kind of think I reduced it to Sunday only, but I still was paying two, $300 a year. And because I was, I wasn't, I'm a New York Times person. And oh. then somewhere in the late 90s, the, oh. uh, the, the uh, commercial appeal, or uh, excuse me, the, the New York Times made a decision to make its content free online. And I hated reading it online. I hated reading it on the screen. I really liked the paper. I liked just the whole texture of it and the, the way you could sort of explore a newspaper. But at some point the renewal came up, I let it go. I stopped renewing because I was reading it online. And I read the New York Times online for free, give or take for 10 or 15 years. And the day they put a paywall up, I signed up and I think that first year I spent about $300. And right now I spend about, you know, $300. And um, inflation adjusted, I'm still paying less, you know, basically than I used to pay when I lived in New York. And so you'll hear a lot of people talk about why newspapers have, have done so badly and have taken such hits. And there are many reasons, some within their control and some without, but I would always argue that many of them were within the control of newspapers. And that fundamentally the choice to give away content for free um, and drive a lot of traffic to the sites without making much money from it and just sort of act like, well, that internet's a sideshow and we're just gonna make our money on print was the fundamental flaw of local and national newspaper journalism over the last 20 years. And so, um, what that meant was, and I think you may have made me 
post. I wonder if I can do it. No, I can't. It doesn't really matter. But part of what I have here is a slide, and I won't dwell on it, is that it, about 20 years ago, um, the, the Commercial Appeal had about 250 local journalists. Um, that was everything from a gardening section of, I think at one point it was a five or six arts and culture. They had a, a correspondent in Washington. They had multiple correspondents in, in Nashville, I believe, at the Capitol. Um, they had uh, you know, all kinds of people, 250 people. Today, they have 27 people, give or take, in Memphis. So it's a 90% reduction. And that's not unique to Memphis, and it's not unique to the commercial appeal. And it's not about beating up on the commercial appeal. It's just about the nature of what happened over the last 20 years. And that, that number accelerated, especially in the last five or six years. And so we launched against that backdrop. Um, we are now a newsroom of about 35 people, for, plus about 20 freelancers. Um, and we are online only. We don't have a print edition. And in that sense, we are oddly enough, one of the largest, if not the largest, online digital only startups, local news startups in the country. That was never our intention. Like, hey, that'll be a great ego trip to launch the, you know, the largest local news site in the country. But we ended up doing that um, because we felt like you know, we didn't want to just launch, not that there's anything wrong with a niche site that just covers politics or arts or business or whatever. We want to cover everything from high school sports, government, um, uh, business, um, education, everything we could get to. I, and I should be, I should reel that back a bit. We don't cover everything, but we try to cover a very broad um, set of topics. And we very much focus on covering the all of Memphis, north, south, east, west, um, you know, the suburbs to downtown to north and south. And so two and a half years later, um, we are doing well, in some ways really well. Um, we, are, we continue to grow. We are a startup in the sense that we lost money our first year and we've always been sort of structured that we would, we would get really big fast and then we would begin to build revenue on the back of that. And so we, are, we have probably, um, give or take 15,500 paid subscribers right now. We get about 2 million page views a month. We have about 55, 60,000 um, email subscribers. And I don't know, 100, 150,000, maybe even 200,000 at this point, social media followers of various kinds between us and our social media, or excuse me, and our writers and, and columnists. And so um, the 15,500 is a really uh, relevant number as you all have probably experienced over the last, particularly over the last two, three years, more and more um, uh, publications you read that were maybe free online are now have a paywall. They now charge you money. And the industry from national publications to local publications has suddenly gotten very, very serious about charging for news content. Now, some do a lot of dollar a month offers, you know, get free, get access for a dollar a month for 12 months, get, you know, $3 for three months. But there, people are charging for local news and national news in a way they weren't for a good decade to 15, even almost 20 years. And that's because from a pure business point of view, um, what people relied on, which was their print revenue and their print subscriptions and certain amount of online ads has been either plateauing or, or uh, collapsing. And everyone sort of woke up and went, oh my gosh, we got to start charging for this very expensive content that we produce. It's telling that the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, who never really made their content free, have been free of the cuts, the level of cuts that virtually every other national publication has had to do. Um, uh, I could point to um, uh, certain local papers. Uh, the Chattanooga Times Free Press, for instance, has always charged a pretty hefty price and made very little for its online content and has never really uh, made its content free. And they have what is basically, the, it is the largest newsroom in Tennessee. They've got sort of 50 to 60 people in the Chattanooga uh, newsroom. And so everyone had kind of an awakening. The New York Times, I talked about that example. Um, early on, or not early on, over the last few years that we can't, we, the New York Times, they said, can't make enough money with online advertising. It's plateauing. It's got a, a kind of built-in sort of cap. And we got to charge for this content we're doing. And they are now at what, like five or six million paid subscribers paying a real rate, paying a lot of money, and they're back into a growth mode. Washington Post followed suit, and lots of papers are following suit. And so, it, for us to be at 15,500 paid subscribers who pay an average of about 9 to 
a month um, is in my peer group of local papers around the country, remarkable. So I'm, and I don't say that bragging, I'm just telling you what they tell me. That's how broken the industry is. So papers that have been around for decades, if not centuries, will have a fraction of that number of paid digital subs. And most of them are charging a dollar to $3 a month for it. They're not really making any money. They're just trying to gather names and gather potential future subscribers who they will charge a lot of money in the future. And so um, our goal has always been to get to about 25,000, give or take, uh, paid subscribers by the end of year five at a net rate of around 10 to $11 versus the 950-ish we get right now. Then also to sell advertising and sponsorships, which we do and events, which obviously we're not doing a heck of a lot of events in the last year. Um, and that's kind of the track we're on. We're also, and then I'll take a breath and, um, and see if there are questions. There may be a question in the, in the, as I kind of finish our little history and who we are. Um, we are, as many of you know, but maybe some of you don't know, we are uh, structured as a nonprofit, um, a 501c3. And so the money we raised to launch and the money we've raised since has all been philanthropic uh, donations. Um, we are structured that way uh, because it's a terrible business. And for us, we raised $7 million to launch and then a follow on round of another million five. And we're actually in the middle of raising, give or take about $3 million right now. And it, it would be, um, I've never, I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards and involved with nonprofits and covered nonprofits. I've never run a nonprofit. We wanted to run this like a business in the sense that we want to hit a goal of being sustainable on subscriptions, advertising, sponsorships, et cetera. Um, we want, but we need to raise money to get there. A lot of people will say, well, just raise a bunch of venture capital, get to your five-year period, and then you start making money, and then you go public, or then you do whatever, and you pay off the investors. Realistically, we couldn't have done that. We couldn't look at any investor, I couldn't, um, and say, hey, oh yeah, this is a, if you got six million bucks to invest, you should do it with us. I mean, there was no way I could say that. It's too difficult a business. It's too, um, but we could say this is an incredibly important um, uh, uh, entity for Memphis. It's incredibly important that this news exists. It's incredibly important that there's a locally focused news so site that is, you know, by and of Memphians. Um, the trajectory the CA was on was they were at a little under 30 when we launched. They added a few people after we launched. They're back down to 27. And it's very clear, it is 100% clear and confirmed that had we not launched, they would have been down to under 20 people by now, maybe even less. They stopped, they, 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 they how would you say it? They, they slowed down the retraction from Memphis as a result of our launching, which I don't say arrogantly, I just say, because we know that, because they told us that. And so we could tell people that, donate this money because we will cover what the things that are important to Memphis, the things that are difficult, the things that are good. Um, that are good, good, not good, not just good news. That's what I, I accidentally said. But the things that are, are, are important and good for Memphis to hear about, be those things that are difficult to hear, or be, be those things that are really good to hear. And so, but what we didn't want to do is be in a situation where we just constantly raise money. There's a big, and then I'll, I really will pause. There's a big, a big wave of nonprofit news sites launching around the country. There are a lot of long time print papers, one in Salt Lake, uh, the Philly Inquirer, uh, probably the Baltimore Sun and some smaller ones that have gone or are going nonprofit. Um, but we did not want to be a nonprofit in the sense that we would be free and open to everyone. I mean, I love that on a certain level, that'd be great. But we wanted to be sustainable. We wanted to, to, to charge for what we did and charge advertising and subscriptions and not have to constantly raise money and not be another um, sort of uh, mouth at the trough of local philanthropy. So, you know, there is all kinds of philanthropies. I'm sure everybody in this group is a part of one that simply can't raise, can't, can't make money in what they do. MIFA can't make money what it's doing if it's gonna fulfill its mission, right? Helping the homeless can't make money if it's gonna fulfill its mission. Local news can make money and still fulfill its mission. So we wanted, that's why we, charge what we charge and we have a business plan like we have. We marry that too because we are a nonprofit and we, we feel like local news is critically important. We're free in every, every school that wants it, which is about 80% of the schools in Shelby County, private, public, charter, et cetera, suburban in the city. Um, and we, with COVID, we extended that free access to many, many individual students and teachers who wanted to be able to take it home. We know parents of those students in many cases use that free access, which is fine. 
um, and uh, an increasing number of nonprofits in town that work with people who either can't afford to pay for local news or really shouldn't have to, we make it free to them. We're free in all the libraries in town, which is a little bit less effective during COVID, obviously. And, and you might think, well, of course, it's free in the library. But the truth is that most publications charge libraries for access within that library system. And so that's our nonprofit mission. We will, and if, if any of you all work with nonprofits that, that, um, that you think, hey, they work with people who can't, can't afford to pay for local news or shouldn't have to, um, email me and we most likely will say yes. It's a very easy, there's no application. It's a very easy process. Um, because we're trying to marry this notion that we will raise money and make money through, or make money, you know, uh, generate revenue through subscriptions and advertising from people who can and want to pay for it. And then we will give it away free to people who can't or shouldn't have to pay for it. Let me pause a sec here and see what, I got some questions um, about journalism and so on. Um, I'll go, um, Carl has a question here, hello Carl, uh, about the role of investigative journalism. Um, investigative journalism is critically important for us. We've done um, some really good things. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do, investigative journalism. Maybe, you know, most famously is the, is the you know, is uh, Woodward and Bernstein, you know, exposing the, the, the lies in the Nixon administration. Um, at a local level, it is often something simpler than that of digging into how a city council person maybe has a contract on the side with somebody they're doing business with. Often it's, it's associated with um, corruption of some sort, but sometimes investigative journalism is just digging deeper and, and more thoroughly into a project, um, for a public-private project. A lot of big dollar projects in Memphis, for instance, involve um, uh, public incentives and tax incentives. That doesn't mean they're corrupt, but there's not necessarily the light shown upon them that, that we would, that I think all of us deserve as taxpayers to understand how those incentives work. And it's not an accusation of corruption. It's just sort of, we got to, everyone needs to understand why this is happening and where that money's going and where those incentives are being focused. And so um, it also is a, a way of holding um, uh, business, political and community leaders accountable to know that someone is gonna dig into something makes people a little more hesitant um, to, to, to maybe do something wrong. Um, and I, a former city councilman once told me that Mark Periskia, so Mark um, doesn't work directly for us, but works at the U University of Memphis and through a partnership contributes content to us. Mark is w one of the you know, best and most storied investigative journalism, journalists in Memphis and has a national reputation. Um, he said that when he was city council, if Mark called him all, he, he would say, yes, no, yes, sir, yes, yes. He, he would tell him what he had for lunch that day. He would tell him how much coffee he had that day. He just would begin to volunteer information because he was so nervous about what Mark might ask him. He never wanted to be caught off guard asking Mark um, uh, or answering Mark inaccurately about anything and anything seriously. And so there's a watchdog element and a, um, um, an accountability element. We've done, I would give us a B uh, on that and some, sometimes maybe a C and sometimes an A. Um, and, and it's something that we, we're in the midst of looking at hiring another um, full-time, ideally a couple of full-time investigative reporters. It's very hard to find them. And it's one of the things that local journalism has really cut back on because to have an investigate a good investigative journalist, you have to give them a week or two or three to dig into a story and it may strike out. There may be nothing there and nothing to write. Whereas most local journalists and most national journalists have to produce stories every day. And that's true for us. And that balancing act is expensive. And so um, it's an important role an important role we try to fill and that we've, I think, gotten better and better about over, over the two and a half years and we'll continue to emphasize. Um, uh, Rick Baker asks, well, Washington Post wrote that COVID-19 has sustained local and regional news sites. Is that true? Um, it is, uh, so I'll tell you our experience with it. Um, we, um, on the one hand, from a pure sort of, ca not callous, but you know, sort of business point of view, um, COVID drove a tremendous amount of traffic to us. So a lot more viewers, a lot more readers. Um, we, like most uh, national and local news sites, made our COVID coverage free. Uh, we did it for about six months and then put the paywall back up because we realized this ain't going away. I mean, longer than we even ever imagined. 
and we just re- we were losing subscribers because we were you know seventy percent, sometimes ninety percent of what we were writing about on any given day was COVID related, and we just got to the point where we couldn't continue to make it free and feel like we were weren't going to run into some sort of financial trouble. Bluntly, um, we still make some stories free. Um, you know, we I think our daily COVID update is free. Um, certain stories of of real impact will kind of make a discretionary choice to make it free, but we put most of our coverage back behind the paywall um, in the fall at some point. Once COVID became something clearly we were just all going to have to live with for longer than we really, most of us really thought. Um, so in that sense, COVID drove a tremendous amount of traffic to us. Um, it it we got a lot of subscriptions out of it in some way, even though so much of our content was free. A lot of people who maybe didn't read us regularly started to read us regularly. We gathered a lot of emails and people who voluntarily signed up for our email newsletters. Um, and many of those have converted and will convert to paid subscribers. But on the flip side, we, we probably lost, I mean, many hundreds of thousands of dollars in, um, in subscribers over that 12 month period uh, because uh, other coverage we've done is less trafficked. Um, you all have probably, if you follow sports at all, you know that virtually every, major sport, is their TV ratings are down 50%. I mean, that's everything from the Kentucky Derby to the Super Bowl to basketball to hockey to tennis, everything. Um, and that's been true of us as well in terms of our sports coverage. And so it's, it, it, it drove traffic um, on a, in terms of a sustainability, you know, the financial side of it, which is how uh, Rick asked the question. But it was important to do, and I, I mean, you know, it, and we, I feel like we did a very good job. Some days, excellent job. Some days, you know, we were finding our way through COVID like everybody else. Um, but it was a really important work, and it was obviously very important that it be made free for at least a period of time. Um, and many news sites have continued to make it free, and I, I you know, I, I, I think that's great. We just weren't in a place to be able to do that. We also took pretty sizable hits in our advertising through the course of the summer. Um, that was a lot of it was what the the sort of things to do advertising, you know, because there was nothing to do. Um, so they all just sort of said, hey, we got to pause our advertising until we can reopen. So yeah, we, and that that those numbers, I know, at least on the local level, um, are pretty true across the industry. And in many localities and many local papers, it was even worse than what we experienced. Um, I think the Washington Post, you know, the Washington Post is now a national newspaper, arguably an international newspaper, like the New York Times, like the Wall Street Journal. Um, and so I think they're a little different in terms of how they, what they saw from it and the kind of traffic and, and revenue they were able to, not, you know, in an ugly way make, but that they were able to make uh, on. In terms of, um, let me skip uh, Rick's question on what's next, and I'll come back to that, I promise. Somebody thanked me, thanked us for making it free to teachers and educators. And, you know, that was, that, that is important. And, and, you know, one of the great things of a school, um, a charter school in Frazier, um, early on pre-COVID, when we said we would make it free to them, um, they said, you know, it wasn't just that it was going to be free. It was the ways they were going to use it in the classroom. So everything from using uh, Jeff Calkins' profile of Penny Hardaway in a writing class, you know, to get kids engaged with writing to, you know, a, a simple update on a Grizzlies or Tigers game to get particularly boys to read. Because if, if you know anything about reading, boys somewhere in around the age of 12 or 13 uh, often stop reading. And so you just want to engage, I mean, there's an argument, you just want to engage them with anything that they will read. And so they use that, or their plan was, you know, they would use that the sports content just to keep the kids engaged, particularly the boys, but the girls also. And then they would use, um, um, you know, uh, one example was, you know, we write about the juvenile. We don't do a lot of last, we don't do any last night crime coverage really, but we do a lot of co- coverage of, of criminal justice issues, the juvenile justice center, crime strategies. And they really liked that and said, you know, look, we can engage our kids in civics, conversation about civics and government about the juvenile justice center in a way we can't if we're talking about national kind of esoteric remove uh, justice issues. And so, um, it's not just giving them free access. It's 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 something that the a, a lot of schools are increasingly using in the classroom in a way that we really love to hear. Um, Eric, yeah, I think I think that if we can take a take a big trip, I think that being able to read the paper every day for children is one of the ways we can develop lifelong learners. Because what else do they have? They don't have books in the home. Yeah. They don't yeah. can't go to the library. So it is a it's a, it's a, it's a lifeline. So thank you for that. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and we 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 hope to um, get even more aggressive in a good way about um, getting free access out to people and organizations and individuals um, post COVID. It's been a little hard in COVID, even though it's probably more needed than ever. It's just like everything we're walking through mud on some of these these issues. Um, uh, Dustin asks, can, how can we, other local papers around the country, replicate the Daily Memphian and better reach their target local community? Um, I get calls, um, almost calls and emails almost weekly. Um, certainly before the pandemic, I got them weekly. And it's interesting that they've started to ramp back up. So I had a call with somebody in Knoxville. I have a call with somebody in Portland. Um, I recently talked to some folks in, I can't remember the cities. Um, about, hey, read about the Daily Memphian, really interested in what you're doing. We have seen our paper get cut by, you know, 70, 80, 90%. And I've talked to somebody who wants to think about launching a paper or wants to launch a site or want, the, 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 the appetite is out there. The interest is out there. Um, and the frustration with kind of corporate run, and again, I'm a capitalist. I don't mean to be ugly about this, but you know, I mean, there's some corporations are great and some not so good. And and local news is a rough, is a difficult fit with a national chain of, of kind of approach because every community is different um, and every city is different, every town is different. And so um, what, what it takes, there's tremendous interest. There are a tremendous number of journalists out there um, who are uh, unfortunately um, looking for work, but it does take a lot of money. It's very expensive. Um, you can launch an, uh, a smaller site, you know, with a couple of journalists and an editor and maybe a you know, small business plan of, of ads or sponsorships. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I sound dismissive when I say it that way, but that doesn't necessarily call, cover the all of the community. And in Memphis, what we had was this incredible philanthropic community. And, and my friend and, and essentially business partner in this, Andy Cates, who's now the board chair, um, you know, Andy and I have been friends for 20 years. And if you know the Cates family, they've just been incredibly generous and civic minded about everything from the Green Line to I'm sitting actually in Crosstown to um, I could go on and on Soulsville and, you know, various charter schools they've supported and just Overton Park and on and on and on. And um, very selflessly, you know, um, supportive. And, and Andy got, Andy was a lover of journalism, is a lover of journalism. We were friends. It's kind of a part of how this came about. And then a whole lot of other people, you know, hundreds and now thousands of people who donated money, who, who certainly who subscribed, who advertised, who, who wanted to support us because they saw that this was important. And you need that kind of community support to make it happen. And um, that's no small thing. Uh, and, and we, you know, we had, a, we had every, the like stars kind of aligned for us and they, they won't necessarily align perfectly for either community that wants to do this, but you are seeing, like I said, more nonprofit organizations starting because it's such a terrible business. You're seeing more traditional papers turn to nonprofit and that seems likely to continue. And you're seeing just continued cutting by the newspapers and I'll point out um, local TV news, which um, um, other than certain individual, uh, you know, people I certainly respect in local TV news locally as a whole, you know, local TV news is is a, is, is a little bit shallow, uh, not as deep as, as most of us would like, and in some cases, pretty damaging in terms of particularly how local TV news covers um, communities of color around this country. And I'm not picking on Memphis, I'm saying everywhere. Um, mugshot journalism, last night crime journalism has done tremendous harm and caused great distrust in, in poor and black and brown communities around the country. And, um, Local TV news, by and large, has been bought up into a series of chains. Um, the FCC reduced the rule or kind of lowered the, the bar for that and relaxed the rules around um, chain ownership of local TV news over the last decade or more. And you're actually seeing now that local TV news, which has been a cash cow for its owners for decades, is starting to run into financial problems. And that's because of cord cutting and people going to streaming services and dropping their local cable channel or you know, dropping their antenna. And um, there's cuts in local TV news and there's more content sharing. And so you get a lot of national news on local TV news now. You get a lot of regional sharing of stories. Sadly, a lot of that is often crime. Uh, so if there's, not, you know, if there's not a crime in Memphis, you grab one from Iowa at the sister station there and you lead with that. 
I'm sorry that a horrible murder happened in Des Moines last night, but I don't really care. But, you know, that can lead your local TV station. And so I think all of that comes together to mean that there'll be more and more locally based, truly local, locally owned, locally run um, news sites uh, launching. And they will be mostly be sites because the print is just so expensive and so difficult to do. Um, back to what um, Rick asked on, he had asked, you know, Washington Post wrote that COVID-19 had sustained local and regional news. And I, I talked about that and my perspective on that. Rick also asked what's next. So I think in, you know, we shifted from kind of this, we're all reacting to COVID and struggling to understand the science and struggling to understand distancing and masking and reopening of schools and not reopening of schools. And it's just was a muddy mess for quite some time at every level, nationally and locally. Um, and I'm not picking on individuals, but it was just very messy and very uncertain where we were going. And now with the vaccines coming out and coming out and growing so rapidly, you know, there's going to be another few months of, of uh, for us on a coverage point of view, aggressively covering, you know, the state opening up to now 18 to 16 and above, depending on the vaccine. Um, and a shift to where over the next couple of weeks, it seems very clear that in Memphis, there will be more supply than demand. And, and I, let me put a caveat on demand. Um, we probably have equal supply and demand for another month or even two, which is good because I'll, unabashedly, we should all get shots. I got my shots. It was great. It was no big deal. I feel like a superhuman um, and it's awesome. The, that's my little PSA. Um, but what's good, the real trick is going to be getting to the people who want shots that aren't able to get shots and haven't been able to, who've wanted shots since January and haven't been able to get shots either because they're not, they don't have the mobility, they don't have the, the, the family or friend or sort of uh, support from some community organization because they don't have phones, or they don't have good computer access um, because they struggled to call the phone numbers, particularly, and I hate to pick on the county, but particularly when the county was running it, it was very poorly run. Uh, the city, to their credit, has really upped the game and gotten smarter and better about it. Um, and we've done a number of stories lately about a number of groups. Um, there was a, a wonderful doctor who got himself approved to drive around with a refrigerator, a medical grade refrigerator in his front seat of his Toyota Camry and go to people's homes and give shots to them and to their caregivers, often you know, a, a, a spouse or a, 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 often a child. That's what it's gonna take and to, to, to get through all the demand over the next couple of months. So again, going down to 16 or 18, will fill up Pipkin and Whitehaven and all the spots. The city has been very smart about moving into more pop-up locations. And it's our job, it's our responsibility to continue to cover that and try to communicate that to people. I mean, at the worst of the confusion about, just to give you a sense of the importance of local news, and this has nothing to do with me personally, um, I often got emails uh, from people in January into February when things were really messy with distribution. People asking me, where can I get a shot? Where can I get a second shot? I went, they, they didn't have shots, help. I mean, it was, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was, and it was the level of anger and frustration was, was a lot. And we did our best. And sometimes people get mad at us because we were reporting conflicting information. And sometimes that was our fault. We should have cleaned things up, but everything was happening so quickly. But as we all know, a lot of times it was just the, the communication was not good about where you could go, what you could expect and so on. So what's next back to Rick's question is, will we continue to cover COVID uh, uh, extensively because it just is the story of our time um, and about availability and where people can go and how they can go and the efforts that are working to do that outreach I talked about we actually have our first ever you know, scientific poll. We hired a pollster to survey people in Shelby County about how many people have gotten the shot, how many people haven't, and for those that haven't, why? Do they, they just haven't been able to? They don't want to? They're vaccine resistant? They don't believe in vaccines? And we'll, we'll write about that over the next few days to kind of help try to raise the, the conversation about um, people, you know, again, I'm, I'm not objective about this, we need to get to 70% of people either, you know, having had a shot. And um, I know there are some people who won't and some people who maybe have very, very good reasons for that or their resistance is not irrational. It's based in all kinds of history and that's fine. But our job is to report on this and report on what the science says and the science is overwhelmingly clear. We'll also write a lot about reopening. 
everything from businesses reopening. I mean, I'm obviously not sitting in my office. I'm sitting in my apartment. Um, and uh, we'll write about businesses reopening. We'll write about arts and, and entertainment organizations and places reopening. Restaurants, of course, which has been the poster child for disruptions of COVID. And so COVID's here to stay is, a, is something we cover for a while. But we do want to begin to move on to covering things like the long-term ramifications, particularly the, the hit to education. I think that is probably the next biggest story of our time is, is the damage this has done to kids. And, and that includes kids at the schools that have reopened, but have had to have these kind of um, um, really limited existence and distanced exi existences and not be able to see their friends necessarily as much as they want or do theater or, you know, do mock trial or play sports. And then certainly SCS being closed for, you know, basically almost a year. I think the long-term ramifications of that, both socially, emotionally, and of course, academically, um, are things we'll continue to cover. And, and, and try to do it not just in a negative way, but like point to schools and point to places where people are doing it right and people are, 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 are focused on the right things and helping people. Uh, I got more questions here. Um, uh, somebody said, so please, that we don't live by the philosophy that if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. Um, we do, th thank you. I mean, that, that really has caused great damage to all kinds of communities um, and, and, you know, the words, I love Memphis, my, Memphis, my adopted home. Memphis has uh, a, a serious crime problem. Every city I've ever lived in, in America has a serious crime problem. America has a serious crime problem. It's not unique to Memphis. And the way that too many local outlets cover crime makes it feel like we're the, we are the only place where whether you're in Tacoma or you're in New York or you're in LA or you're in Memphis, that it's the only city that has this massive crime problem and that the, the criminals are right on the other side of the bush. Um, and, and that is a disservice to communities. Crime is terrible and it's, it's something that has to be discussed, but it has to be discussed in a, a more um, uh, holistic sort of way. Um, um, racial demographics of the subscribers from Carl here, a non-subscriber. We definitely skew um, in terms of paid subscribers um, and readership overall, we're, we're not representative of Memphis. If Memphis is a 60, or say the county in the regions of 50, 50, uh, or you know, slightly majority black um, area, and obviously the city is 60% plus black, we're not 50 or 60% black in terms of our subscribers. We don't ask every single person, but we do sampling and so on. Um, we are getting better. Um, our new staff is what, 25% black, but even that, it, it's not even so much, it, it's important to hire a diverse staff, that's critical, but we do try to cover the all of Memphis. And so we try to cover everything, not just you know the Poplar Corridor, um, not just white owned businesses. We try to make sure that, um, and, and that has been the, probably the single biggest reason um, based on some surveys that other people have done and feedback I've gotten of why more black people don't and brown people don't um, read their local news, there is a long history of really um, uh, damaging coverage by local news outlets. Um, you know, as somebody told me in um, um, the Orange Mount area, I did, I, around, around the time we launched, I went to a community group there, invited me, um, probably 30, 40 people there talking about local news. And a woman stood up and said to me, um, um, look, uh, I, I don't read the Daily Memphian. I will never read the Daily Memphian and here's why, because what you do, and she said it as if, this, as if we do this, what you, what you do is um, we will open a farmer's market, we will open a new business, we'll have a kid go to Harvard, we'll have a teacher of the year, and you won't cover any of it. But if someone gets their purse stolen out of a car, you'll have three you know, helicopters and two uh, news trucks here like that. And that's what you do. And of course, she wasn't really saying it to me. It took me a moment to realize because she had said she'd never read us and we don't do that kind of coverage. What she meant was me as a media person, as a local media executive, as, particularly as a white male one, you know, and, and the, the history and afterward in a very, very Memphis way, you know, she kind of gave me a side hug and she talked and we chatted. She, she wasn't angry at me. She was angry at what local media has done to her neighborhood and the way it has presented her neighborhood. And so that's the kind of stuff that's going to take the long time of, of, of building trust as a local news organization, as a local media organization, uh, with communities that have been unfairly covered for so long. And so I do think we've seen improvement in that, and, and that's a good thing, and we'll, um, uh, 
uh, continue to go in that direction. Uh, uh, will the Texas Energy Experience drive MLGW TVA? That is, if you're not following this, you know, MLGW has a chance to, to break away from or renegotiate a new contract with the Tennessee Valley Authority for, for the bulk of its electricity. Um, there's a big group, there's a group of well-funded folks pushing for TVA to go to a, a, a kind of a co-op situation. Um, obviously, the people who don't want MLGW to leave TVA use the Texas disaster to say, don't go there. If you, if you leave TVA, that's gonna happen. Excuse me. Um, the, the truth is, if you look into what happened in Texas, it was a whole series of decisions they'd made over a number of decades to isolate themselves, to be totally self-reliant, to create a market that worked really well when there wasn't an ice storm, um, but that was not built for a crisis. Um, I think that, so I would say this, that the, the, the Texas experience should inform everybody in the country about how they get power and what redundancies they have built in and the amount of money they spend on their, their capital and their infrastructure um, from light utility poles to underground and so on, because that really is a big part of what wrong, went wrong in Texas. They didn't require all their power providers to weatherize in a way that was necessary in hindsight. Um, they also were too dependent on a market kind of thing that I can't go into, but it fascinates me. And I've listened to way too many podcasts and read way too many articles about it. Um, I, I don't know where it'll go with MLGW and TVA. I think, and I won't give you my opinion, but I will say this. Suddenly TVA, once MLGW started making noise about leaving, TVA got real, real present in Memphis. And their president um, started spending a lot of time here. They started talking a lot about increasing the amount of tax incentives, increasing the amount of, of, of money they could put into building more infrastructure here. And, you know, that's where I'm a capitalist. I mean, if you have leverage, use it. So I don't know if we should or shouldn't leave TVA, but boy, we've got leverage. We're the biggest customer, MLGW, I say we, we as Memphis are the biggest customer, I believe. Um, and we should use that unabashedly and unapologetically. And whether that means leaving or staying is, is I don't know, um, and isn't my place to know, but it is something where we should get, we, we, should, we should get more out of this and we should, um, shouldn't be afraid to ask for more and, and leverage for more. Maury, hey Maury, how are you? Um, uh, ask how are things going at the radio station? The radio station is great. Um, the radio station very quickly is, uh, was formerly the jazz station that the University of Memphis ran for many, many years or decades. Um, they, as they said, they, they kind of ran to a point where they just didn't have the revenue and the support that they needed or the, the listenership they needed to make that viable. Um, bluntly, um, David Rudd, the outgoing president, who's done, I will say unapologetically, has done amazing things for U of M. No one's perfect, but he's done amazing things for the University of Memphis and he's been a real gift to the city. Um, he, um, called me and Andy Cates and said, hey, you guys want this radio station? <laughs> and, we, and the joke is that I was about to jump over the table and say yes, and Andy had to grab me and say, no, we were already running a news site. We cannot take on a radio station. But we talked and it, it made clear there was something there and we got Crosstown involved and then um, uh, U of M stayed involved. And so it's, it's been rebranded and relaunched as WYXR. It's a very, a volunteer run um, radio station. Emily has a show on there. There's a little bit of talk. I do an interview show on there. It's mostly music. Um, it still has jazz. We're, it's not anti-jazz. I should say we, because I'm a board member, full disclosure of WYXR. Um, the, the reception has been incredible and really fun. And it's been, for me, a very fun thing to be a part of um, as a board member and as a resident of Crosstown. And I think once this pandemic lifts and the, the restrictions lift, you'll see more and more kind of fun stuff coming from them. Um, some uh, Carl, Carl has a bunch of great questions. Carl must love, I hope you're a subscriber, Carl. I, I'm pretty sure you are because you, you really think about news. Um, Carl asks, have you deferred to the CA when they cover a story so well that you might say, well, we won't touch that story. Um, you know, sometimes you get beat and the CA has beat us on stuff without a doubt. Um, as has the MBJ and as has the flyer. I feel like we're winning the game, but you know, they beat us because they've got some good journalists there. Um, it depends. We, we, we might follow it. We might try to add something in hindsight that they didn't cover. Sometimes it, what, you know, if, if we get beat on a story, it's just so important that we just have to continue to cover it fully. And we, we have to balance the assumption. You know, we don't want to assume that everybody is a news junkie like I am where I read everything every day. 
And so, you know, sometimes people are like, well, I already read that yesterday in the CA. Well, most of our readers didn't, you know? And so it's, that's always a balancing act. You see that with the national news, you know, the, the, you know, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, particularly kind of fighting an AP and Reuters, you know, who covers what first, but you can't assume that everybody has read it. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Uh, do I see travel recovering and coverage locally? Does that what, Brenna, who was, who, somebody asked about travel recovering and I, I, I'm not quite sure what you meant there. Um, so uh, apologies. Um, Charlotte asked, how can Memphians make Memphis better? You know, I, I will say this is as a, as a trans, as a, this is my adopted city. I've lived here for 25 years. I raised my kids here. Um, my kids who one's lives and works in LA right now, I just graduated and my daughter goes to school in New York. They miss Memphis immensely and, and, you know, certainly want to get back here. And I, uh, as an empty nester, I guess I could live anywhere, but I never thought twice about leaving. I love this place. And, um, I've lived in a lot of different places and there is this sort of, I think for a lot of people who are transplants who've lived elsewhere, um, the nice thing about Memphis over the last 25 years, and particularly over the last five to 10 years, a lot of that defeatism that used to be around or the kind of like the, the hang up, the chip on our shoulder, we still have a chip on our shoulder, we're Memphis, but there's, there's a less defeatism and, and more optimism. And I think that's great because Memphis for all its problems um, is a fantastic place. And it's been a fantastic place to me and to live and to raise my kids. And to have lived elsewhere is to know, you know, I mean, the most racist people I've ever met were in Manhattan. You know, I mean, um, the, the, the worst, most segregated living conditions I've ever seen in my life were in Alaska. Um, it, it, the, the, the schools in places where my friends live, public schools in Seattle, Washington, wealthy, rich, uh, you know, liberal oasis, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, they kind of, many of them have gotten to where they can't keep their kids in the public schools there. Um, the homeless problems in Portland I mean, there are homeless problems everywhere, but the homeless problems in Portland pre-pandemic, let alone now, are, will take your breath away. I mean, that if you haven't been there in the last five, 10 years, I mean, rows and rows of young teenage kids living on bridges and openly doing drugs. And I mean, and we're not talking marijuana. I mean, we're talking heroin and we're talking meth. And um I mean, blocks and blocks of kids. I mean, the most breathtaking thing you've seen, huge homeless encampments. The country has these problems and they manifest themselves in cities and they manifest themselves in rural areas. I mean, there are massive uh, issues of, of in rural areas as well and, and medium-sized areas. And so um, how Memphis makes Memphis better is we continue to do what we do well, which is to believe in ourselves. And, you know, we do have a chip on our shoulder against the rest of the world and and, and we continue to be giving and philanthropic and, and so on and, and, and continue to have the conversation about our problems. You know, sweeping under the rug doesn't help, but acting like we're the only place with problems doesn't help either. I guess that's my, I'm, my, my two cents on that. Do I have one more here um, from Jocelyn? Hello, Jocelyn. Um, hey, how are you? Last time I saw you was when we were, you were, uh, it was about uh, the radio station, wasn't it? I think we were in a meeting. Yeah, it was right before the pandemic hit. Um, was there a Trump effect impact on the news? And if so, will that change with him not in office? The only Trump effect we had was in that we, we, um, we've never really covered national news. We don't have a national section. We talked about doing it. We actually planned to do it pre-launch. We were going to just use the Associated Press and have, you know, sort of a little section of national news. We just didn't get to it because we had too much going on. In the end, I was really glad we didn't because everything is even pre-Trump, but you know, certainly post-Trump was so, or during the, the present Trump's administration, was so politicized. And so I have friends at other newspapers around the country, local papers, and they would, you know, they said, look, if, if we publish a simple seven paragraph story of what President Trump said last night, just the account, we will get cancellations and accusations of being political. And the same thing will happen if we do a Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, um, just a simple, Here's what she said, not, it's just, this is what she said. We're not drawing any conclusions. Everything was so political. They really wanted to get out of it, but the tradition of local newspapers for many print local newspapers is that you cover national and people rely on you for that. So you're in a quandary. We didn't do any of that except in pre-COVID, except let's say if there were you know changes in tax policy that would affect local people or local business, or if there were changes in the trade wars, 
you know, and that would obviously hit, hit FedEx and, and logistics. So we would, national decisions of local impact, we would cover. Well, then COVID came along, which was suddenly a national and international story, and then suddenly became very politicized. And that was odd. And, and when we were trying to report on what, you know, the local epidemiological experts that the city and county were relying on were recommending masks, for instance, early on, and pointing the data that showed them as effective, we would report that. And then we get all this feedback that we were being anti-Trump or we were being pro whatever. And it, it was a balancing act. And I think we did well with it, but um, that, was, that was a challenge. Um, we got no, because we didn't cover, you know, people talk about the New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, you know, Fox News, everybody getting a Trump bump. We didn't really get that because we weren't covering day in, day out. Um, uh, presidential tweets and 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 all that, but we it had an odd impact on our um, um, our because COVID became so politicized. Um, but you know we're we're to whatever degree moving past that. Any other questions? I feel like I've I, I know we've got to go here at some point. I probably hit some sort of time limit. I can keep talking, but um, anything else? Are we good? Yeah. You want to look at that picture of me again? <laughs> yeah, let's look at that picture again. <laughs> but Eric, we, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your very, very oh, thank busy you. writing novels, running to Alaska, all of your <laughs> all of your adventures. We certainly appreciate you yeah. joining us tonight and 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 for making us that and well in everything that you do, for making us smarter citizens. Yeah. And well, we really you. appreciate that because I don't know anywhere else we could get that right now. So, well, you're, the, you. so you're top of the heap. <laughs> and and just to you let are you in my on a little you, this is, yeah. you are making my month. Huh? <laughs> Great. And mm -hmm. just to let you in on a little secret, we are just about all news junkies. So you're among <laughs> friends. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And if you have questions or anything, just email me. It's uh, I'll put it in here. It's Barnes at dailymampion.com or, or like I said, if you have nonprofits or community organizations you work with that, that, you know, should get free access, please do let me know. I would really appreciate it. It's great to see you smile. <laughs> I, I got two shots. I got two shots. I got two shots. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Get a shot, everybody. And we will be back in touch. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank All you, right. sir. Our next meeting will be April 13th, and that is an exciting meeting that Jimmy has uh, arranged for us with Face in History Facing Ourselves. And if you haven't, if, you, if you're not aware of Face in History Facing Ourselves, I guarantee you, you will leave with a whole new awareness. So be sure to, be sure to you know, tune in there, tune in then, and anyone else that you think might be interested in awareness, which is, I guess, our uh, theme for, well, actually theme for, for all of COVID, uh, have them tune in and just um, send them the link. Uh, also, I want to introduce my sister who is visiting with us tonight, Lori Powell. <laughs> and I guess you would call her my sister, well, it wouldn't be my sister by another mother. Oh, my Charlotte, sister. You're funny. I, I am joined late and then I would I sent my message because the so just introduced I, I used to be a member of Idlewild um many years ago and Charlotte and I her mom kind of raised me at the mental health center. She was one of my mentors. And um I'm the CEO of Alliance Healthcare Services in Memphis. Um we're the uh large um, community mental health center. And I actually presented at the, um, the Memphis Rotary at lunchtime today about, you know, about my agency. And then Charlotte and I reconnected and it was just meant to be, so. That's good. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll be, we we'll probably will uh, reach out to you because your presentation today was fascinating. 
and it's right in line with what we already think. So thank you so much, Laurie. Sister Laurie, thank, thank you so you much. Sister for Charlotte, and, <laughs> and I sent my message for um, the Daily Memphian has run four articles about Alliance um, in the last six months, four articles about what we do. And then I sent my message because I'm so tired. It's been a long day to see Cape. So sorry about that. <laughs> We're forgiven. Any any other announcements or comments or anything else we need? Not okay. Yeah, um, I was just going to add really quick. Um, Alliance Health Services, they also have a program with Community Alliance for the Homeless, um, the Housing First Team. And then also, Lori, uh, great presentation. I saw that earlier today. But um, I think Pan had something else to add as well. I was just going to um, say if you want to judge uh, essays for Snowden, they're very moving. There aren't a lot of them, but uh, we would love to have you. So please follow Denise's link that she sent. Thank you, Denise, for sending it. Thank you, Pan. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Laurie. Anything else? Um, BJ, anything you want to share with us tonight? Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. I uh, just want to commend the, the great work that you're doing. I did uh, share in the last district board meeting about the level of engagement that you have with so many of your, your leaders uh, within your club and how you've laid out the 12 month plan with the various different projects. And I counted 22 different leaders. And uh, that's for to have nearly 50 members and that many different leaders engaged and carrying things forward. I uh, just wanna make sure that you all are on point to apply for the presidential uh, citation with Rotary International. You've earned it. And uh, so I'll make sure that you have everything that you need and uh, we've got, one more quarter here, and we'll make sure that you're on point, but the money's on the table, make sure that you get it because you've certainly earned it. Thank you, BJ, it's a team. Well, I think instead of team, I can say it's a family. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Anything else tonight? Hey, Kate, it's good Sorry, to see you. Okay. Hey, it's Mireya. Yeah. I just want to thank you um, and Ben for helping me make some connections in Memphis. Um, Pleasure. For those of you who don't know, I'm from California and I'm trying to get myself to Memphis. So I'm tempor temporarily in uh, south of Nashville here. But I want to thank um, Charlotte for keeping me um, in the loop and making some very significant connections for me. One of them, which included Ben and then Ben's connected me with other people. So thank you all so very much. Welcome to the family. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well, in the words of Will, Will always say, go out and serve. So um, I'm just repeating Will's mantra, go out and serve, thank you. Let me say this, because I know I say it every time, but I really appreciate everyone helping me. And, so, you know, and then sometimes I get like, oh my goodness, something else. And I just keep getting propped up. And I really appreciate that because, um, we have a lot of different and varying views, but one thing that we always come together on is service, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night. Hi. Good night. <laughs>